Hello, hello. Yes. Okay, so welcome to this uh, afternoon session. It's a pleasure to introduce uh, Jose Antonio Carrillo, Imperial College London, and he will give uh, how many talks are you giving? Two talks. So a short course on the degenerate Keller Siegel model, fair competition and diffusion dominated regimes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you to the organizers for the kind invitation here. and. Um, so uh, today I want to uh, uh, report about some recent works uh, in the direction of the, uh, the Keller-Siegel models with uh, degenerate diffusion, mainly about uh, stationary states for uh, this kind of uh, problems. And um, um, I will uh, basically uh, um, uh, concentrate on uh, two particular regimes that I call like fair competition and diffusion dominated. You will understand uh, in a few slides what they refer to, okay? So what's the uh, outline of the uh, two talks? So first, I would like to explain you the motivation for this, from where I, uh, I came with these uh, kind of questions and what, uh, why I'm interested in answering some of those uh, precise questions. And then I will concentrate first on the, telling you the different regimes and explaining you from where it comes. Then uh, we'll uh, discuss on the fair competition case that, as the, say, as the name says, it means that it's a kind of competition between two different mechanisms that are somehow fair. And uh, then I will concentrate on the, the diffusion-dominated case. Okay. So I will do a kind of mixture between uh, Blackboard and uh, slides. So I will uh, prove some things on the board and, uh, and uh, remind you some computations on the board. Okay, so the first part about the motivation. So what I, I want to do is to minimize interaction energies. We will see why I want to do that and why this is connected to uh, those problems I mentioned. So let's start by uh, just uh, fixing a bit uh, the basic ideas. So let's assume that we have uh, M particles which are interacting uh, by a, a, an interaction potential that I'm gonna call U. And uh, an interaction potential for me is going to be just a symmetric uh, potential, which is C1 except maybe at the origin. Okay, so there could be a singularity at the origin. Anyhow, we'll assume that there is some value for the interaction potential at uh, zero. I will give the value zero, even if there is a singularity. And uh, uh, when I talk about the interaction of M particles, I mean this kind of interaction. Uh, you can think about it as uh, coming from uh, Newton's law. Okay. So I have M particles which are interacting through Newton's law, where you have uh, the second derivative equals to the, I mean, the mass time acceleration equals to the sum of forces. And you can think this as the term that is coming from the sum of forces. So say the presence of a particle at position xj is producing a force onto the particle at position xi, which is in the direction of the vector xi minus xj, and we insert a strength that is given by the potential u. So that's why you have gradient u xi minus xj. Then the mj's are just weights for the effect of each particle. Assume that they are equal, it will be one over n. The, you will assume that each particle produces an effect of one over n onto the other, and then you are adding all the forces. So this is like the sum of the forces. But what do you have here, the first derivative? Because I assume that uh, somehow the inertia term is negligible, and I assume also that there is a kind of, of uh, dissipate, dissipative term. So there is a kind of uh, uh, dumping term in the equation. So if you write m x dot dot plus k x prime equals uh, sum of the forces, then you are just uh, neglecting the inertia 
um, bring in uh, then a first order differential equation instead of a second order differential equation. So somehow you are assuming that the particles, they, are, they, uh, they quickly, without inertia, they adjust their velocities to the sum of the forces, okay? So it's the simplest interaction between n particles. Good, if you want to write now, instead of a particle system, you want to write a continuum model, then you want to pass to an equation for the mass density of particles or the uh, probability density of particles. So I'm gonna call rho Tx the density of particles at time t, meaning by that, that uh, this gives me the probability of finding particles at location x or the, uh, uh, the local mass at location x. It depends if I want to normalize or not, the total mass to one or not. Okay, so if I want to write something continuous, I can uh, just follow what I did here for the particles in a continuous way. So in fact, uh, uh, probably I should explain a bit more uh, this uh, relation. I don't know if uh, somebody has talked about mean field limits before or not, but uh, probably not. Okay, so but what you can do is uh, given this uh, uh, m-particle system, you can associate to the ODs the following uh, uh, measure that I'm gonna call it empirical measure, I'm gonna call it mu n, which is the sum from one to n of uh, the weights mi and Adirac at location xi of t. xi of t is the solution of the ODs. So this is obviously is a measure that depends on t, and it gives you exactly uh, the value corresponding if, uh, at, uh, is a deterministic uh, measure if you want, in the sense it tells you precisely the locations of the particles because you have this combination of Dirac deltas, okay? So you define this, this is usually called the, uh, the empirical measure. And uh, now if you want, uh, if you look at the right hand side of uh, this, you can think about that, the sum mi gradient u xi minus xj, j different from i, somehow you can think about this as the gradient of u combined with the mu n. Of course it would be the case if the potential is smooth and since it's symmetric the gradient of u at zero is zero, so this is exact and then the fact that I'm taking j different from i doesn't make a difference. So now you see more or less the idea. You see that uh, you think about this as the empirical measure. What you are expecting is that when you get more and more particles to approximate the continuum uh, density row, then somehow this probably you could expect that this converges in some sense as measures to some limit. And if you are able to identify the limit, let me call it row t, maybe you can even say Sun, uh, you can give the evolution for that uh, row of t. So answering this question, answering if this, uh, there is a limit and there is a law for uh, what is the evolution of row of t is what is called the mean field limit. Okay, and there are plenty of works both for this kind of equations and for uh, kinetic equations trying to derive rigorously uh, a macroscopic equations out of the dynamical systems. In this case, under certain assumptions on the potential u, you can do that. And in fact, now you see what uh, you expect is that somehow when you take more and more particles, this will be approximating this gradient u combined mu n. It hopefully will be approximating when n goes to infinity by gradient u combined the density rho of t. And then what you expect is to have a velocity field given by uh, this formula where you have the sum of the forces again. Every infinitesimal uh, part of the mass of rho is producing a force at location x given by gradient ux minus y. You integrate, you sum, you get the total force. And then the velocity field is gonna be minus that quantity. Okay. So the minus is just uh, by convention for uh, the potentials, how I'm using it. 
So, in other words, so you expect to have at the continuous level a velocity field which is given by that convolution with the gradient of rho with the gradient of u. And then another question is what is the law for the evolution of rho? And what one can expect is that the evolution of rho is given by a continuity equation. And uh, this is a kind of a, uh, exercise for the uh, students present in the audience. You can check that at least if u is smooth, let's say C2, we bound the second derivatives just in case. You can check that uh, mu n of t is a distributional solution of this equation that they have there. So of d rho dt plus divergence of rho u equals zero and uh, u given by minus the gradient, ah, sorry, b, I call it, and b given by minus gradient of u both with the density. With initial data, which is just the sum of the Dirac's at the initial locations. That's uh, pretty easy to see, and uh, that's a good exercise to understand what is happening. So it's not a surprise that uh, you expect this equation at the limit, because somehow already at the discrete level they are solutions. Okay, so this can be rigorously proved also in the case in which U is not uh, as smooth as what I was saying here, but this requires other, other uh, techniques that I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna discuss today. And anyhow, I want to concentrate on this kind of uh, model for, for a while. Okay, so the next thing I want to say is about the potential U. So typically, in many of the applications that you would like to use this, let's assume for simplifying our life that U is radial. So U of X is a function of modulus of X, let's say K of modulus of X, okay? Typically, this K as a function of R, of modulus of X, you're gonna expect to be decreasing and then increasing. And what it means this, decreasing means that the potential is repulsive at short distances with the signs that I, uh, I chose here, while, so up to here, say, if the other uh, particles uh, are in a lo located at position uh, X, the other particles at position Y, the force that I feel is attractive, uh, sorry, repulsive if I am at a distance less than this, let me call it L, the minimum, while if I at a larger distance, I will feel an attractive force. And typically, the potentials that are interested in many of the applications are repulsive attractive potentials. Good. So uh, the next thing I want to uh, comment is about the repulsive part of the potential. Uh, well, this I, I, I really don't care right now. It could go to plus infinity or to, or to a constant and have some saturation. These, uh, there are, I will treat different cases. Both are interesting, yes, for different reasons. But today, mo mostly in my talk today, they are gonna be potentials that are gonna decay to zero, in fact. And, yeah, well, but both are interesting, a priori. Uh, then the next thing I want to uh, comment is about the, repul the repulsive part of the potential. So another way of modeling the repulsive part of the potential is by, instead of doing it non-local, and now that's why I'm inside the theme, this is non-local, maybe I can do also the repulsive part local. What it means to do it locally? So I can assume that the potential, I have uh, two separated parts, say, and a repulsive part, uh, let me call it uh, U capital R, an attractive part. Okay, let's assume that you have like this. And uh, for the repulsive part, I can take something that is really, really, really very repulsive in the sense that maybe I can put a kind of a scaling parameters there, epsilon. I can assume that this U epsilon, well, is somehow, as the epsilon goes to zero, very close to a Dirac at zero. Okay, this will mean that 
is really very repulsive, hardcore repulsion in a sense. I want to think about it like this. Well, so formally what happens with that equation there, so let's separate the repulsive and the attractive part. So I have the repulsive, okay, the force will be given by, velocity field is this, minus gradient UA, combo of rho. And now, yes, I said to put this uh, scaling parameter. Now this approximately, then if I put a Dirac delta here, of course I cannot do too well the gradient of the Dirac, but uh, what I'm gonna put is the gradient on rho. I come both with the Dirac, so formally this should be minus gradient rho, minus the gradient of UA come both rho. So somehow, if I do a very repulsive force, at least uh, in this way, I recover for the repulsive part this term minus gradient rho. If I look now at the equation, um, so I'm going to write it on the other side because I have the minus, so I will have minus divergence of rho v, so it's a divergence of rho times the velocity field. Okay, so this is what? This is divergence of rho, gradient rho, and then from the other term I get rho, gradient, the attractive part of the potential combo with uh, rho. Okay, so for those of you that uh, were here yesterday in the talk of Juan Luis, and I'm sure that probably it appeared last week, I'm not gonna do chak chak, but uh, I can write uh, here like uh, Laplace of rho square and here one half, okay? And then the rest. Okay, yes? And then uh, the first term is exactly the porous medium nonlinear diffusion, the general diffusion exponent two. Probably something like this appeared yesterday. But it's uh, the local one, okay? So at least formally you can recover from uh, very strong repulsion this nonlinear diffusion. So I'm gonna discuss a bit more uh, uh, this kind of uh, models and I will concentrate today precisely in a model like this, where I have the attractive part, uh, uh, I will consider it non-local, so I will forget from now on about the A. I will think of you always as an attractive potential, while in the repulsive part, I'm gonna assume that it comes from a local pressure uh, function, so I can put something more general than uh, just a gradient of rho, I'm gonna assume that I have there a gradient of a function of rho. Directly from the particle system, even formally, I can recover only the power two, okay? At least in that case. So the question is uh, now, um, if I do this, if I model repulsion by the, uh, this nonlinear diffusion and uh, the attraction with this non-local convolution of this interaction energy, when does a balance between these two forces happen? And in which sense it means that you have a balance. So I would look for a balance between the forces, typically will give me to a kind of a stationary state. So my question is, do I have a stationary state or not? What can I say about that? Okay, now the next ingredient. These equations, in fact, for the uh, experts in the room, they know perfectly that there are perf uh, particular cases, at least formally, of being what is called a gradient flow of certain uh, functional with respect to Wasserstein distance. Okay, I'm gonna try to explain just a bit what it means this in practice. I'm not gonna in, uh, uh, get into the technicalities of the Wasserstein distance because it's not the objective of my talk, okay? But just to give you an idea why there is uh, something like a gradient flow behind. Okay, so, I'm already uh, introducing uh, this uh, uh, Lyapunov functional. Let's check that it is in fact uh, this uh, energy, that I'm gonna call it free energy, F of rho, which I'm gonna write in the particular case of a power. So let's do a power and then you see how it goes. So uh, let's, uh, on, the, on the board I'm gonna use P of rho equals rho to the M. So here you will see that the right thing to do is one over M minus one, the integral of rho to the M. And uh, here you have one half double integral 
of u of x minus y, rho x, rho y. By the way, I didn't ask, is it large enough? Okay, thanks. Um, good. So, yeah, let's check that, uh, at least formally, this is a Lyapunov functional for that equation in the sense that it should decay in time among solutions of the PDE if, every, if everything in life is good. And uh, we can take all kind of derivatives and integration by parts. So let's compute formally what is the derivative in time of f of rho. In principle, this is just a function defined on Lm functions, L1 Lm functions. And I'm assuming that they have on you the enough uh, uh, properties such that this is well defined for L1 functions. Okay, let's not enter into the details yet. So I want just to compute formally what is the time derivative of f of rho, where here rho now is a solution of this PD. Okay, let's forget about the A, as we said. So. Um, Okay, so this is the equation that I'm, I'm, I'm uh, aiming at because uh, I want to use uh, P of rho. Aha, uh -huh. okay, somebody could have that, yeah. So this is not the right thing to do. It's m over m minus one, sorry. Okay, the constants are not important, but let's write the right constants. That's uh, the P of rho that it has to be in order that I get this equation. But um, it should be written there. Probably should. Uh, uh, okay, so the thing is, let's first, uh, um, yeah, so I'm starting from this equation. Uh, okay, so I forget the other constants, that's why I got it wrong first. So let's forget about the other things. So I have uh, d rho dt equals this, and let's compute the time derivative, but for that, the first thing I'm gonna do is to rewrite this in a different way. I'm gonna write it like, uh, again, like I had it uh, written before, divergence of rho times something, and if you recover what did you had to do in order to get here, did you see this one is divergence of uh, gradient of rho to the n? So in order to uh, recover rho gradient of something, you have to multiply and divide by the right constant, which is this one. So you have here m over m minus one, rho to the m minus one, okay? You take the gradient of this, you see the m minus one goes away with the rho n minus two times rho is rho n minus one with the m gives you the gradient of rho to the m. And here I had just to write u con both rho. Okay, so this and this are the same. So once I have written it like this, well, the first thing I'm gonna uh, realize is that all of this, I'm gonna call it like this and then I will explain what it, it, it means. Okay, I'm just gonna call it like that. If you want right now, it's just a notation, which means variation of f with respect to rho. We will check that later. But nevertheless, I can write the equation in that form that is written there, no? d rho dt equals divergence rho gradient of the variation. Good. So at least, formally, what it means variation is that the time derivative of f of rho is gonna give you d rho dt, the integral d rho dt times the variation of f with respect to rho. This is, if you want, the definition of uh, the variation. Or if you want, I can write it over here now, if you do some kind of uh, pertur uh, I mean, uh, perturbations of rho, you compute this. You expect this to be an integral of, the vari of what I'm calling the variation of f with respect to rho times phi, for phi being such that rho plus epsilon phi is uh, measure, so I need that the integral phi is zero, okay? So you're doing just uh, variations of f that preserves the mass of the uh, density rho. 
You can compute what it is, and then you can realize that uh, formally it gives you an expression like that. And in fact, you recover what is the variation. The variation is exactly what I have written here in this particular case, what I have written here uh, between brackets. So that's the variation of this function. OK? With respect to rho. OK, so that's why you have uh, this formula over here. And now, once you have this formula over here, now it's uh, just that uh, you need to uh, substitute the equation. d rho dt is minus divergence of rho, gradient of the variation with respect to rho, times the variation with respect to rho. You integrate by parts once and probably got the sign wrong somewhere, um, because this is a plus. It's not a minus, okay? So I integrate by parts now, and I get minus the integral of rho, and then you have gradient of the variation of f with respect to rho, a scalar product with gradient of the variation, so what you get is this square. Okay, so the whole structure of the equation is in such a way that you have this uh, kind of uh, magic formula that at the end of the day, you have a derivative of f of rho is minus rho, the gradient of the variation square. This can be done with a general uh, pressure law, and the relation between phi in the functional and p is written here. And uh, yeah, this gives you the more general case when it's not a power. Okay, so the main message is that for this kind of model, you have this uh, Lyapunov functional, and then, if you would like to obtain a stable stationary states for this kind of PDE, um, you would expect to have them as local means of that energy function. So what you are interested in, in local minimizers of uh, this, uh, this function. Okay, so all of this just to tell you that this is the main objective of my two talks. I want to find uh, uh, properties on local minimizers or global minimizers if they exist, and I can say that they're global, for functionals of that form. Okay, so this problem, in fact, is quite classical in some particular cases. So what I want to know is precisely now uh, find at, uh, the assumptions on the attractive part and the repulsive part in such a way that I have a local mean at least. And uh, this is quite, um, quite classical, as I said. And the first, probably the first uh, uh, case in, the, in which this was um, widely discussed is for crystallization. But there, typically, the uh, potentials are very singular at zero. They are kind of Leonard Jones potentials, so they are not even locally interval. So I'm not discussing those cases. In fact, for me, I want to do it with densities, with the L1 functions. So the minimal assumptions I'm gonna uh, put on you is that U is locally interval, okay? So another very classical case is uh, for uh, semiconductors and uh, in astrophysics, and also in uh, math biology, for chemotactic movement of cells, where cells go up the gradient of, cert of certain chemical substance, then you end up in a, a problem like this for, for the particular case of the Newtonian potential. So you there is typically Newtonian potential either in two dimensions or in three dimensions. Okay? And the classical cases are always with linear diffusion, which will correspond to take here rho log rho as the uh, uh, functional there. If you, this is a comment I sh probably should have made. If you want to recover here linear diffusion, you see that m equals one, you cannot get it so easily, but as a kind of limit, and if you do the limit as m goes to one, you recover there the log, okay? So the function will be the integral rho log rho. There are other applications um, in which uh, this question uh, appears, so, uh, in mean field games in Curno, uh, to find Cournot Nash equilibria is uh, one particular application of this for potential games. Also, in fractional diffusion that you have heard so much during the last um, eight days, uh, if uh, you take U 
a potential more singular than the Newtonian, up to int uh, local integrability. In fact, uh, this is uh, nothing else than uh, the in an inverse uh, fractional Laplacian. Okay. And finally, there is also an interesting application for uh, the eigenvalue distribution of random matrices, which is again a particular case here. Typically, uh, you the uh, it would be the log interaction, but in one dimension uh, is a particular case of interest in that case. Okay. So also, I want to mention that uh, this appears in uh, also some problems in math biology. So one of the, uh, the cases is what I said before, the uh, chemotactic movement. And I want just to mention this because it's the most classical one and gives you a bit more of the uh, modeling issues there. So just quite uh, quickly, um, you will have typically an equation for the evolution of the cell density. So n is what it was rho before, in a sense, because I have a density of cells. And you're assuming that the cells, they are just uh, uh, attracting each other. Uh, uh, why they are attracting each other? Because they do it through the interaction uh, via this chemical substance C. So you compute, so you have another equation in principle for the uh, chemical substance. Uh, this uh, C gives you the concentration of that chemical. And then for that, you have in principle this kind of reaction diffusion equation where you have a, a source that is uh, proportional to the number of cells. So if you do that, and uh, if you neglect the blue terms over there, you end up with uh, solving this Laplace inverse of the density in order to get C. And if you write this in terms of the fundamental solution, you recover an equation of the previous form where the U is the Newtonian potential, in this case in 2D. Okay. So it's a particular case, of course, is this uh, what is usually called the uh, parabolic elliptic uh, uh, Keller-Siegel model. And typically, this is done with uh, uh, linear diffusion. But uh, nonlinear diffusion has been also included by many people in the modeling side to model um, uh, the size of the cells so to avoid overcrowding. Here you have uh, just uh, somebody playing around with a pipette with a chemical substance to which these cells are attracting to, and you see that's the kind of thing that you are trying to model when you have plenty. Okay? Good. Another reason why I came to this question is also from math biology models. There are these uh, models of swarming that I'm not going to enter too much, but just to mention that uh, it was uh, somehow a, a, a motivation that triggered uh, my attention, because in those kind of models that I don't want to explain a lot, what you have is uh, larger scale patterns that come from the movement of uh, different animals that they're producing some coherent movement, a kind of, uh, a kind of flock or a kind of uh, meal, like in this uh, fish shoal that you have in the picture. The interesting thing is that many of these um, can be explained with uh, basic mechanisms among those that action on repulsion and some models that are used uh, there, very uh, basic models, they, re they uh, give you um, equations which are related to these ones with different potentials. So this to say that um, not only the Newtonian potential is interesting that appears for the uh, case of the chemotactic movement, but they were using other potentials like potentials uh, behaving like modulus of x, either attractive or repulsive at zero independently of the dimension and uh, with uh, certain applications here. So it makes, uh, it makes sense to look at uh, different behaviors of the potential U and not just restrict to, say, the Newtonian case. OK, so I think it's enough for the motivation. And now let's get into a bit more uh, mathematical details. So now the time after lunch is over. Now we get more into math details, OK? So, I will concentrate on uh, the case, on the particular case in which both the, di the uh, diffusion and the potential are homogeneous. So, I'm going to take the particular case in which I have rho to the m as the diffusion, as I already wrote here, and let me start with uh, 
discuss and think about the particular case I, I'm going to do, which is I'm going to put also this homogeneous. So I'm going to assume the u of x is modulus of x to the power k divided by k. k. And here k, in principle, is going to be something between minus dimension and dimension. Dimension is d, no? Yes. OK? For me, k equals 0 means the log. And it's just a notation if you want to take it like this. Uh, the restrictions y, k between minus dimension and dimension, I will explain them uh, in a couple of slides. Um, OK, let me start then, before discussing anything there, let me start by doing some computations with the f of rho. OK, I'm sure that uh, this computation will not surprise any of the experts in the room. But this is the first thing that you have to say to students that uh, you, they haven't seen it. They haven't seen anything like this before. So the first thing that you have to do with this kind of uh, uh, energies is to look at uh, how they change by dilations. OK? So let's take a density row. I mean, it's just a given L1 LM density. And uh, let's take any parameter lambda positive. Let's define the dilation, rho lambda of x, that preserves mass as lambda d, rho of lambda x. OK? And then let's compute f of rho lambda. Why in doing so? Because uh, since I assume that uh, both the diffusion and the no local term are homogeneous, maybe I can work out the lambda. Uh, in the computation. So let's uh, see what is the dependence on lambda of f of rho lambda. So it's somehow I take a rho and looking at a kind of curve through rho, which is given by the, these uh, dilations, and I see how the, fu the functional uh, works there. Okay, so let's do it. So substitute there, I compute. So help me with the change of variables. From the first term, I will have what? I'm going to try to do directly the change of variables. So what I have is rho of x to the power m. And then I will have a lambda. So I will have a lambda to the dimension times m that was there when I put the rho lambda. I'm changing variables. So I will do lambda x equals y. So then I will get minus d here. Do you agree with me? OK, this is just changing variables y equals lambda x and calling x again y. Good. Then from the second term, I have 1 over 2, double integral. Then here is easier because uh, essentially when I do change of variables both in x and in y, uh, I will recover here an x over lambda, y over lambda, so I have a 1 over lambda that uh, goes outside, so I will have lambda to the minus k. Agree with me? Good. So you see, because they are homogeneous, I can get the lambdas out. And now we see something. We see that depending what's the balance between the m and the k, one term or the other will uh, be a uh, uh, dominant, in a sense. So it's clear that if they are equal, so if I have d m minus 1 equals minus k, somehow I have the same homogeneity in both terms. That's the case I will call fair competition. In that case, what I have is that f of rho lambda is in fact homogeneous. And I get lambda minus, uh, well, it doesn't matter what I take out. Let's say that I take out lambda minus k. I forget about the m. I will have this property in that case. OK? While if m is such that d times m minus 1 is larger than minus k, then this is an exercise for uh, the students. You can check in that case, that there is a, a global a minimizer of this function as a function of lambda. It's a one lambda star such that you have a minimizer of this. 
And uh, so, your, I mean, your function goes from uh, zero. Well, it depends uh, where the M is. So I don't want to enter in now different cases. It doesn't matter. There is a minimizer of uh, the function for all cases. And um, you would expect somehow that um, uh, in some sense, uh, I want to think about it that the uh, diffusion uh, overcomes the, the, uh, the attraction or the possible aggregation due to attraction. So that's why I call it diffusion dominated case. And of course, we have a third regime, no? So what uh, d m minus 1 is less than minus k, that I call it, since this is dominant in that case, I will call it, uh, you will see why it's dominant. I will call it aggregation uh, dominated case. OK? So let me discuss uh, why these names a little bit. I know that I have some friends in the room that will not be uh, will not like some of the names here for some of the regimes, but uh, let me try to convince you that they are good names. Okay. So first, the diffusion dominated the regime. Well, I'm just writing in a bit different way. So the m has to be larger than d minus k over d or one minus k over d, as you prefer to. Uh, uh, yeah, I prefer just to get uh, the regime in terms of M. So in fact, for that case, in the particular uh, case of K equals zero, you see in K, K equals zero will mean that I'm taking here the log. So for K equals zero with the log here, if M, this uh, simplifies to M larger than one. And in fact, uh, already that case, uh, Calve and myself, we studied this uh, some years ago and also independently Sugiyama did some works also in that case. And we were able to show at that time is that no matter what, uh, the, uh, no matter what the initial data is, you have always L infinity bounds on the PDE, on the solution of the PDE, which are uniform in time on top, okay? So this will uh, probably uh, uh, surprise some uh, people here that know about the keller Siegel, but I will explain you what's the difference later on. And well, the, the standard keller Siegel, in fact, let's uh, make this comment somewhere. Probably here. Or the classical keller Siegel. This corresponds to, say, dimension 2, uh, k equals 0, and m equals 1. Okay, you just check with those uh, numbers. It's exactly one of the cases of the fair competition. Okay? Which is what I'm going to discuss, uh, well, also here. In the case of the fair competition, in fact, what you can, uh, I will convince you that uh, uh, here you have, in general, a very similar situation as the classical keller Siegel. So for the non-experts in the room, let me explain you what happened for the classical keller Siegel, what it was known there. In fact, it was known that here there is something that uh, is called the critical parameter. OK? And now for doing that, I'm going to put a parameter here. Okay, so I'm going to change just the functional, and instead of having one, I'm going to put here chi. Okay? Because I want to fix the mass of the density. I'm going to have unit mass. The L1 norm of rho is 1. Okay, and uh, dealing with probability densities. So then I'm going to put a parameter chi in front of the uh, attraction. Then in this uh, classical keller Siegel, it was known that chi equals 8 pi is the critical parameter in the sense that if chi is larger or less than this critical parameter, 
different things happen in the fair competition in this uh, classical Keller-Siegel case. If chi is less than 8 pi, it was known that there is, there, there, assist global, uh, there is global assistance of solutions. While if chi is larger than 8 pi, the generic thing is that there is blow up in finite time. And for the critical, there are plenty of things known by now, but let me just say that there is global assistance of solutions, and they blow up, but in infinite time. For some initial data. It's more complicated than this, but uh, let me just uh, say these three things today. Okay. In fact, um, also, uh, in the critical case, you have infinitely many, infinitely many stationary states. Sorry, it's a bit small, probably. You will have it uh, very soon in the slides. So you have infinitely many stationary states, and some of them, and they have some basin of attraction too, apart from the ones that uh, blow up in infinite time. So the situation is very complicated for the critical. The important thing is about the, this uh, dichotomy. Uh, this dichotomy in terms of this critical parameter, if the parameter is small, so if the uh, interaction, the attraction is small, then you have global assistance, but if the attraction is large, then you have blow up in finite time, and if the attraction really gives you some particular, for very particular case, then you have a sac compensation and you have a, a sta a stationary states. Okay, so I will convince you that in fact, and I already advanced in some of the results, this is exactly what happens for the whole fair competition case. Okay, every, every time that you have this um, uh, relation, as soon as k is negative at least. And finally, let me mention that uh, you have also this uh, aggregation dominated case. And uh, there, again, some particular cases were, no, uh, were known. Uh, essentially, these two uh, works that I mentioned in there are for, again, uh, the Newtonian case, taking uh, k equals zero, or k equals Newtonian in several dimensions. And uh, then they were able to show that independently of the parameter if you want, independently of chi, you may have, oh, for any value of uh, this chi, you may have either blow up for certain initial data or global assistance. So meaning that there is no a critical chi. Both things can coexist for any chi. Okay? So, I like to call it aggregation-dominated regime because it's not telling you that everything aggregates, but it's telling you that the diffusion is not strong enough to avoid aggregation, okay? So don't think about aggregation-dominated as always giving you blow up, no. Just telling you that for any value of the parameter chi, you have always initial data for which you blow up in finite time. But this can coexist with other initial data which are spread enough, and they exist globally, okay? Again, what the two works I'm mentioning here are particular cases. So now what I'm going to show you in the last 10 minutes of this first part is a bit on the fair competition case. Let me see if I can finish that. And then I will concentrate on the diffusion-dominated case. Okay, so let me see. Uh, um, There are probably two, com uh, two computations I can do even before starting with the fair competition case, which are interesting, I can do on the, on the board, to even clarify a bit more these uh, different regimes. Uh, okay. I will rewrite again the PD here. So the... Um, so let me write the PDE here, d rho dt. 
divergence. Uh, I mean, the constants are not that important at the end of the day. Um, so, yeah, okay. Rho gradient, rho to the n minus one. In fact, for this one, it will be m over n minus one here, plus rho gradient of modulus of x to the k divided by k combo rho. Okay, good. So, let me do a, a computation here. So, remember that this is also Laplace rho to the m plus divergence of rho, gradient modulus of x to the k divided by k combo rho. So also that you understand a bit uh, what happens with the aggregation dominated case. So let's compute formally. Uh, yeah, the, this, the constant disappears here. It's, uh, it gives you the plus rho to the m. And in fact, uh, I don't have the constants there, but uh, follow this one. Okay, this one is correct. Good. So let's compute uh, the evolution of the second moment here for this. So formally, I want to uh, I want to see this. I mean, I put the derivative respect to t inside, if I can do this. And now let's integrate by parts, but let's write it directly from there. The Laplacian of the first term goes directly on the x squared over two and gives me the dimension d times the integral of rho to the m. So that's the first term. The second term gives me minus the integral of x, because the gradient of x squared over two gives me x, and then an integrating by parts already, and I have here rho, and then I have the gradient, so this is dotted with the gradient of u x minus y, so let's put what it is. Rho x, rho y. Okay. Now let's work uh, just a little bit here. This is uh, what? This is in fact dot x dot x minus y to the x minus y to the k minus uh, one minus two. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Rho x rho y and just computing the uh, gradient of modulus of x to the k, which gives me x modulus of x minus y to the k minus 2. Now, I, I keep this the same. Now, what I'm going to do here is to symmetrize this. So I change x by y here. Okay. Since this is symmetric, this is symmetric. Here, I will get y minus x, and here I get y. So I'm going to change one half of this by one half of uh, symmetrizing. So you can convince yourself of what you get is minus one half, the double integral of x minus y dotted with x minus y, modulus of x minus y to the k minus 2, rho x, rho y. You agree with me? So then uh, here you get x minus y, x minus y squared. So you can add it to, to this one. And finally, what you get is d integral of rho to the m minus one half double integral of x minus y to the k rho x rho y. Okay, and you see that you get the two terms of the free energy. And now, if you want, I'm going to rewrite this. And believe me, if you do the algebra, this is d times m minus 1, 1 over m minus 1, the integral of rho to the m, plus uh, yes, uh, here, yeah, okay. So here uh, you will get uh, uh, let me write the, the end of the computation, plus m minus 1 over 2, the double integral of uh, modulus of x minus y to the k, rho x to rho y. I think it should be, uh, there should be a d. Okay. 
So in fact, you can, uh, you can see from here somehow, again, the uh, exponent appearing because uh, it, it, you choose exactly this relation, d m minus 1, uh, d m minus 1 uh, equals to minus k. Okay? So, what you can uh, see is that uh, this gives you d times m minus 1 f of rho. So this, comput this computation uh, to tell you that, again, in this particular case, in the case of the first competition, if you uh, take the evolution of the second moment, you recover the free energy times a constant. Okay, so we will see what are the implications of this. Um, so let's leave this uh, computation right now there. And, um, and let's see what is the implication of this. Good. So let's concentrate then on the fair competition case where dm minus 1 equals minus k. And let me tell you what are the results that you can prove there. So the first thing is that, of course, you, you have this property on under dilations, as I already said here. So if you have a stationary states, uh, they will correspond, uh, uh, or uh, global minimizers, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. They will have zero energy, and they will correspond to the value of, uh, I mean, of the optimizers of the zero energy for F. I will explain you from where they come later, so um, when do you have them, really? But a priori, from here, you just see that your minimizers will have zero energy. This is exactly what I mentioned to you that uh, was known for the case of the uh, classical Keller-Siegel. Plenty of people involved in, in uh, part of this dichotomy. I hope not to have missed any important person. If uh, I missed, I'm sorry, it should be included. Okay, so you have this uh, the dichotomy I mentioned. And uh, now let me uh, 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 just uh, uh, point out that uh, when k is negative in the range, remember that k is always between minus dimension and dimension, okay? So if k is negative, it's between minus dimension and zero, then just because of the relation that I have here, m is between one and two, so your diffusion is nonlinear in the sense of porous medium case, while if um, uh, k is po uh, positive, is between zero and dimension, here you get a diffusion which is between zero and one. This is the reason if you want, uh, uh, the, uh, this is the reason if you want for the uh, bound from above of di being dimension, not to have an m which is uh, less than zero, the bound from below on the di minus dimension is precisely in this range to have here something which is a local interval. Okay? Good. So should I stop now? Is it uh, the right time to stop? So let me uh, stop here and then I will continue discussing the fair competition case. Thanks.